You see, my dear brothers and sisters, uh, we have a very unique uh, opportunity here in Australia and Canberra specifically. And that is for us to know and truly understand and internalize and really keep to ourselves and not just keep ourselves but to really internalize and, and, and master is to understand our purpose of creation, our purpose of life. And surely once when we are able to understand this and really appreciate it and then to internalize and live it, then we are in a better position to invite those people apart from ourselves, apart from the Muslim community here, to this beautiful deen called Al-Islam. And really mankind is in this situation. We all woke up in this huge factory where there's thousands of people working away, lots of things going on. And imagine that we are in this factory and all the doors and windows are shut and sealed off. We see people working, sleeping, spending all their time inside this factory. Now, what should a sensible person do at this point? Imagine today or tomorrow you will end up in this factory and you are in that scenario and you're just seeing people carrying on with their life working away whatever what are the first things you're going to do are you going to just get up and just sort of start joining in see whatever they're doing or are you going to ask how did i get here where am i going and what am i doing here and this really is a metaphor for our existence on planet earth there are so many people my dear brothers and sisters so many people out there, so many people in the world who don't know what they are doing here. It's absurd that even the pencil in their pockets, the paper that they write on, the spoon that they eat with, or the food that they eat has a purpose, yet they don't have a purpose, yet they as individuals don't have a purpose, or they themselves don't realize what their purpose is. So can you imagine that these people are now just, they just got up in the middle of that factory and they just started working away now. They just joined in. That's what people are doing. People, unfortunately, are following each other like sheep. Like lambs to the slaughter. Because the slaughter is going to come, right? The de death is going to come. Death is surely going to come at one point. I mean, even the, uh, the British, I don't know if they have that saying here, they say there are two things certain in life, right? Death and taxes. Except if you live in Dubai, then you don't have much tax. But you have zakat if you're a Muslim. And if you're a non-Muslim, then you don't have to even pay jizya there. So that's probably an exception. But the Quran, my dear brothers and sisters, reminds us also, even though we are claimed to be believers, we claim to be followers of the Prophet wasallam, but do we really act according to our purpose? Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُمْ جِنَّا وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ that I have not created men and jinn except to worship me. Now many of us might hear this in a khutbah or in a speech and think, okay, well I pray, I fast, I do hajj. It's a small percentage of my time. So am I really fulfilling my purpose? And we should all be thinking that. And we'd argue from a bare minimum point of view, then yes. Because if you live your life according to the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the fact that you drink orange juice and you don't drink beer, the fact that you eat halal meat and you don't eat pork, the fact that every that you make sure that you, you walk to the masjid and you don't walk to the bars and the other places of, of, uh, of uh, sin and iniquity, um, then that is you worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because at that point you are making conscious decisions or maybe subconscious decisions based on your habits that you've developed that when you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it manifests itself in your very being and in your very actions. But really, my dear brothers and sisters, what is really quite important for us to think about is, is to ponder, keep on pondering about the signs of Allah. The Muslim my dear brothers and sisters, is a reflective person. The Muslim takes lessons from everything because indeed in everything there is a lesson. Even in your, even the Prophet ﷺ said that wondrous is the affair of a believer. That when something bad happens to them, 
they make toba or they say istighfar or they're patient with it, right? And if something good happens to them, they are thankful. So the believer, a Muslim, takes lessons from everything, whether it happens to him or her or to anybody else, or they observe the world around them. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ لَآيَاتٍ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ Indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alternation of night and day are the signs for those of understanding. And then Allah goes on to say, الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَىٰ جُنُوبِهِمْ وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلَا سُبْحَانَكَ فَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ That those are the people who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sitting or lying down on their sides and giving thought to creation of the heavens and the earth. Oh Allah, and they say, oh Allah, you did not create this aimlessly. Exalted are you, high above you up of such a, such a frivolous thing. And so protect us from the punishment of the fire. And Allah says about the Ulul Al-Bab in the verse before, Lub in Arabic means depth. People of depth. Not superficial people. Not just people who look at something, okay, that's what that means. People who ponder deeply and are people of depth themselves and of deep thought and remembrance. And then those people who are saying this, the people who have come to this conclusion, which should be all the believers. رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ لَا تُبْخِ لِلنَّارَ فَقَدْ أَخْزَيْتَهِ وَمَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ مِنْ أَنصَارِ And indeed those who you admit to the fire, you've disgraced him. And those, and those for the wrongdoers, there are no helpers. And they keep on making dua, brothers. They keep on making dua. They keep on saying, رَبَّنَا إِنَّنَا سَمِعْنَا يُنَادِي لِلْإِيمَانِ أَنْ آمِنُوا بِرَبِّكُمْ فَآمَنَّا ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار أو indeed أو our Lord indeed we have heard a caller calling to the faith and who is this caller محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم we have heard the words of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم not directly but by hadith that's how we hear the words of the caller here and that caller said believe in your Lord and we have believed so the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said believe in your Lord and we responded so forgive, O oh our Lord, forgive our sins and our misdeeds and cause us to die with the righteous. Rabbana, Rabbana, and they carry on saying, Rabbana, inna, uh, Rabbana, uh, uh, Rabbana, wa'itana, subhanallah, Rabbana, wa'atina, afwan, yes, my, my, my script's a bit blurry here. Rabbana, uh, wa'atina, ma, wa'atana ala rusulik, wa la tukhzina yawm al-qiyama, inna ka la tukhlifu al-mi'ad. And then they say, that, Oh Allah, Lord, grant us what you promised us through your messengers. Now it's for all the Rasul. And do not disgrace us on the day of resurrection. Indeed, you do not fail in your promise. And Allah then responded. Allah then responds to us saying, Never will I allow to be lost the work of any worker amongst you, whether male or female. You are of one another. So those who, and then it goes on and it describes some of the characteristics of the Sahaba, but by extension, the, the, the bit before that is general and it applies to all of us. So my dear brothers, this purpose of life is not something to just sit back and rest on our laurels and think, okay, alhamdulillah, we are believers, we pray in the masjid, we go do our ibadat and this is it. No, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a bigger plan and a bigger role for us in society. Allah says, "Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas ta'amurun bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna ali munkar wa tu'minun billah." That you are the best nation ever extracted for mankind. You enjoy the good, you forbid the evil, and you believe in Allah. So our service as leaders is a very unique definition of leadership that Islam gives the Muslim ummah. We have no choice, my dear brothers and sisters, but to be leaders amongst mankind. Because we are from the best Ummah, and that is the Ummah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is the best and the Khairul Khalqid, who is the best of all creation, let alone the messengers, let alone the Anbiya. And he has been given the best of books, that is the Qur'an. That the most truthful of books is the Kitab of Allah. And he and the best guidance is that of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So within this deen of Islam, we have to understand, my dear brothers and sisters, that you should not have merely inherited your religion. If you have, alhamdulillah, we are not going to question your iman, 
but we should re you should ask that is your commitment like those who have discovered their, their Islam later on in life? Or have we taken it for granted? In fact, my dear brothers and sisters, we should not be struggling with the basics anymore. We should not be struggling with Salah. It should be enough for us to know that the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever sees the time of prayer come and go, and they miss that time of prayer, then he has committed an act of kufr. It's an authentic hadith. And this is worse, my dear brothers and sisters, to miss an act of to miss a prayer deliberately, not because of some emergency or forgetfulness or sleep, but for us to forget uh, that one prayer in its time, or sorry, to miss a prayer in its time deliberately is an act of disbelief by consensus. And according to some of the ulama, like the Hanbali Madhab and even some of the Shafi'i scholars, some of them consider it to be dis uh, some of it. Some of them consider to leave prayer in itself to be disbelief outright. That you're not a believer because you're not because belief al iman is not is badly translated as faith or belief. In fact, it can't be translated. So when we were talking about words in Arabic that can't be translated, this is yet another one of those ones. Iman is 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 tasdiq bil qalb, which is affirmation in the heart. Wa wa shahada wa shahada bil lisan and to testify on the tongue wa amal bil wa amal bil jism and it's also actions by the body this is iman that's why iman goes up and down as the quran says yeah the quran says that iman goes up and down of course even in our hearts the iman can also go up and down but even in all these other facets ahlus sunnah wal jamaah the the, over, the orthodox Sunni Muslims have agreed that Iman is these three things. And really, my dear brothers and sisters, what is our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like? You know, we see so many talks, don't we? Uh, the concept of God in Islam. And really, my dear brothers and sisters, I will say to you that there is no concept of God in Islam. Because Islam, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an absolute reality. He is al-haq. He is the absolute reality. We don't have this pie in the sky approach to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we shouldn't do. My dear brothers and sisters, we need to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala part of our life, not the bit part player. That we call upon, you know, like you know, people doing the... For those of us unfortunate to remember Bollywood films, that they go to the idol in the time of real deep trouble, then we Muslims will go to our masjid and we are kneeling on the ground and we are begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But apart from that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are ghafil of him. We forget about him. We call upon him only in times of hardship because even the mushrikeen used to do that. The Quran talks about this, that when they're being tossed about on the waves of the oceans as they used to travel, that out, then they would leave their shirk. Then they would call upon Allah, Mukhlisina Lahuddin. They would call upon him sincerely for the for for him, calling upon him sincerely. And then once they get back on dry land, then they start worshiping Allah and Manat and Al Uzza, these idols. At least they used to do that. I mean, we Muslims, we forget even about, forget the worship. We don't do anything. We think about the different mobile phones and the different plans and what car we're going to upgrade to and uh, all these kinds of things. At least they had some religiousness because we Muslims, we don't even direct our spare, our good times to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to any object of worship. And our problems, yes, we all have problems. But you know what, no matter how short, small our problems ultimately are, then the only peace we can find is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to be, the, all the adhkar of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he used to recite in the morning and the daytime. Alhamdulillah, some brothers in the UK, they printed a book of the adhkar al-sabah uh, wal-masa, you know, the adhkar of the, day, the, the masnoon, uh, the authentic uh, uh, the authentic supplications from the, from the sunnah which talk about the supplications of the night and the day. My dear brothers and sisters, I can't tell you that in it you will find every good and every khair that you look for. 
Whoever says, Hasbiullah, Alladhi la ilaha illa hu alayhi tawakkadun wa huwa rabbul ashr azim, seven times in the morning after Fajr prayer till sunrise, and if, you, and if you didn't have time to do that, up until Zawal time. And whoever does that after Asr prayer, till sunrise, or even till half the night, if there's an excuse for it, then my dear brothers and sisters, the Prophet said, you will get whatever you want in this life and in the Akhirah. SubhanAllah. Adkar such as, Allahumma aafni fi, 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 fi badani, wa aafni fi sam'i, wa aafni fi, fi basari. Oh Allah, give me safety and, sang- and, and, and safety and security in my body, and in my, in my, in my hearing, and in my sight. Inshallah, this will protect you from all kinds of illnesses and diseases and loss of this, the blessings of these senses. Whoever says, La ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika lah, lahul mulku, lahul hamdu, wa ala kulli shayin qadeer. Ten times again at the time of sabah and ten times in the masah, in the times I've described, then for them a hundred sins are wiped out and a hundred good seeds are added to their account. And this is life, my dear brothers and sisters. This is being with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is when you're walking on the street. You know, people might think you're mad talking to yourself, but really you should be talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any worry in your mind, talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Stop chewing the ears of your poor friends and your poor family members who are sick of your problems. Keep talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he never tires of this. Because as being al-ma'bud, as being the ilah, as being the one who is his, his, he is the one who is worshipped. He is the one who is called upon and we do not worship any other than him. Then he loves this. Because this is his attribute. It is his name. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is, he does, not, does, does do nothing without a purpose, without hikmah. In our sajdas, our prayers have become empty houses, a bit almost like our masajid. Our prayers, what do they mean? After our prayers, then we do the real dua. Huh? This is, is this from the sunnah of the Prophet Or did he say, the salah is the dua? The salah is the dua. But again, my dear brothers and sisters, we've, tr- we've, we've, we've treated Islam like just a bunch of rituals. Actions, meaningless actions. We don't even know what we're saying. We're standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the world. We have an audience with him, an individual audience with him, as he subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who can be present and in, in, his, in his knowledge and know exactly what each and one of us are saying. And as some of the scholars have said, that even in your sujood, even in the fard salah, it is permissible to do it in your, in your own language. Because think about it, my dear brothers and sisters. At this point, you are closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is supposed to be no barrier between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says so many times in the Quran, he says, yes, alunaka, to, they, 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 about the believers, that the, the Sahaba used to come to the Prophet Sallallahu and ask various questions. Yes, alunaka anil ruh, or yes, alunaka al, an, an madha yufiqoon, that what should they give? They ask you, then Allah will say, Qul, say to them such and such. You do, you do, you've already been given a little bit of knowledge about the spirit. Or give, uh, you know, just give what is, uh, give, uh, give the af for as part of the, of the sadaqah. But in one instance in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yes, anni ibadi fa inni qareeb. Allah does not say all here. Because even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at this point wants to show there is no barrier. I'm not going to even put all here. I'm not even going to put all in the Quran. He says directly to us, fa inni qareeb. Ujibu da'wat da'i ida ta'an. And I respond to the caller when they call upon me. And as we know, we don't necessarily get what we exactly want. Because we don't know what, whether this is best for us. But at least we will get it even in the hereafter or it will be rewarded for it and compensated better. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last third of the night descends in a manner that fits his majesty towards the lowest heaven. And he asked, who is there that I will ask, that who is asking for me, and I will give it to him. 
for her? Who is there that is asking for forgiveness that I will forgive them? And we are there. Not responding. No responding. Astaghfirullah. Indeed, my dear brother. Astaghfirullah. That's all we can say. The Lord of the world comes towards us and asks us, and yet we do not respond. Astaghfirullah. And indeed, my dear brothers and sisters, we should not underestimate the impact of our sins, but it is our impact of our sins that stop us getting up from tahajjud. It is the impact of our sins that make us ghafil about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the more knowledge we get, the more practice we do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like, um, obviously we're not going to make this analogy, but you can imagine when you go to the gym and you're with your coach, the coach is there to push you harder, to keep stretching you, and the minimum, the 10 bench presses is no longer enough, it's going to be 15, it's going to be 20, it's going to go up to 30, 40, 50 to 100, and therefore 10, 15 is not acceptable anymore. This is why, subhanAllah, you know, if we get into this habit, and these things should become habit, we should feel like we have not eaten or breathed if we have not done our dhikr for the day. We should not feel that we have fulfilled our acts of worship if we have not come to the masjid at least once for Salat al Jama'ah. We should feel that we've really missed out. We've really missed out. And you feel your iman go down. It's not right when you don't come to the masjid for a day because of work or busyness or something like this. You will feel that lacking. And of course, likewise for the sisters, of course, coming to the masjid is not recommended, though it is allowed, but for them to even keep their houses good for their husbands, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they get the reward of their father that their husbands do. It's no problem. And this is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he, he brings us and brings us the reward according to our ease and according to what is inclined to us, which we incline towards in our fitrah. So many of us, brothers and sisters, we may think, you know, we're working hard, we are uh, planning for our futures, retirement, maybe we want that, to go on that halal segregated beach somewhere, we want to go and relax, we want to enjoy the blessings of Allah. And for some people, that is the idea of bliss, that is the idea of complete happiness. But we know that in this life, my dear brothers and sisters, even we would get bored of that. We would get not just bored of it, there'd be something in the back of our mind, that when's it going to end? When's it going to end? When is this ni'mah going to end? Or we'll be thinking that what, what will happen to me in the future? What about my children? There's always something to worry about. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create our nafs to be satisfied by this dunya. My dear brothers and sisters, our souls were created for the place where our parents, Adam and Hawa السلام, came from. Our desires will only be satisfied by Jannah. Our desires will only ultimately be satisfied by Jannah. The Prophet said that if uh, the son of Adam was given two valleys of gold, he would want a third. Insatiable. And in another hadith, the Prophet said that the only thing that will fill the son of Adam's belly is dust. Which can be taken two ways. One, is that, that it literally fills it up. And secondly, that in the grave, that's when it's ended. That's when your desires from this life are ended and the hereafter awaits us. So really, my dear brothers and sisters, the real hayat and tayyib, as Allah said that he'll give to the believers, is from this life of ibadah. This life of ibadah. And my dear brothers and sisters, we have a unique opportunity here in Australia. where it is not enough to be just the pious person sitting in the masjid or staying at home. My dear brothers and sisters, this is uh, very important that you realize this. The Prophet Sallallahu these are his words, not mine. He said that I am free. Again, the word bara'a in Arabic doesn't translate very well, but I'll explain it. But for the, uh, for the flow of this hadith, I'll just translate it as being free. That the Prophet said, I'm free of the one who dies in the lands of the mushriks. Now, 
this disavowal, it's actually the word is disavowal in, in English, which means that he has nothing to do with us. He's not, it's the opposite of being your ally. The Prophet ﷺ will not be our ally or he's free of that person. He cannot intercede for us on this issue with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if this command is met. Wallahu a'lam. And that, now, what do we do now? Do we all up sticks and leave and all those, uh, all that image, all that citizenship we work hard for, that's all thrown away? No, my dear brothers and sisters. There is actually another way. Both the ulama of both past and present were, fa were fairly unanimous. They agreed that the only way that we can stay permanently in the land of Kufr, Darul Kufr, is by calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by giving da'wah. We, my dear brothers and sisters, have to convey this message. We are not just another ethnic group. We are not just a group of people that are just here to make up the numbers, make up the workforce. A lot of us here, I know, are serving the Australian government in our contracts and in our uh, jobs here, because this is the capital city. But that is not your ultimate job. That's your means by which you establish the Salah. The Prophet said that Rizq was only given to establish the prayer. Did you know this hadith? Rizq was only given to establish Salah. What does this mean? This means that we should be giving to, to establish Masajid. We should, be, we should be eating so that we have the strength to perform prayer. We should be putting shelter over our families' heads, giving shelter to our families so that they can pray there also. Our whole the whole maqasid, the whole objectives of all these worldly things is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But here also is to call people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And my dear brothers and sisters, you don't have to be Zaki Mike, you don't have to be Ahmad Didat. The fact that you know why you are a Muslim, that you've been given your purpose of life, that you've been made for a purpose, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us his perfect book, and he has preserved it, and he has given that book for us as a guidance, not just for the Muslimin, but for all of mankind. How is the rest of mankind going to know if we don't tell them about it? And if you don't know why you're a Muslim, then you're in a little bit of trouble. But if you know why you're a Muslim, then Alhamdulillah, that is enough to be getting on with. The Prophet said, Ballighu anni walaw ayah. Convey from me even if it is just one ayah, and at least we know, Qul huwallahu ahad. That we know at least. And if we are lacking in confidence, and my dear brothers and sisters, I make an absolutely unashamed plug for our Call of Duty course. We will be having at the Spence Musalla this Saturday, starting from 9.30 p.m. till about 4. It is a, a not so intensive training, dawah training course, We're using the Quranic methodology of giving dawah without going through refutations of other, detailed refutations of other religions, going through the reasons why you already know why you're a Muslim, but to structure it in a way that you can convey this to any single non-Muslim, whether they're Christian, Jew, Buddhist, Hindu, atheist, agnostic, Qadiani, you, you name it. A one-size-fits-all. So my dear brothers and sisters, please do not uh, inshallah, we have some flyers to give out at the end. There'll be some. There'll be a brother giving out flyers at the end. Please do take that opportunity to really start fulfilling your obligation. Start fulfilling your obligation because remember, all these ayat which talk about us as an ummah, talk about us as, as, as an ummah. They don't just sit down and stay static. We're a dynamic ummah. We're an ummah that call people to the khair. And if they don't listen then at least these people know what we're about and they will no longer fear us. Because my dear brothers and sisters, if we don't call them to Islam or explain what Islam is, all they are going to see is a bunch of people in pajamas and sisters dressed as Batman going to the masjid. That's all they're going to see. They don't understand. They don't understand because my dear brothers and sisters, we don't tell them about Islam. We let the media do it for us and as the media does a very good job, yeah? Of course it doesn't. The media's job is to scare. Like shaitan, shaitan, you he, the Shaitan tries to scare his awliya into doing his bidding. And some of the shayhateen in the media, 
they have this fear that they want to spread to people about Islam and Muslims. Yet they don't know that this is the very thing that's going to save them, not just in the Akhirah, but in this life as well. And the Muslims are, are striving to live the life that some of the non-Muslims, but by becoming Muslims, are leaving. And they're the ones going back saying, hey, this, there's nothing there. It's all a mirage. It's all rubbish. It's all a waste of time. But we Muslims are heading towards that way, thinking there must be something shiny there. It's just a mirage. Just like in the desert, when, it, when the, due to the, the sun, it looks like there's water, there's an oasis there. It's not. It's just reflection. And we think that there is something that the grass is greener on the other side. No, my dear brothers and sisters. These people who look like they're enjoying themselves go home at night crying. These people who look like they're having such fun, they go home crying, they are in, they, they are in such worry and concern, they don't know what to do with themselves. They don't know where their life is going. In fact, the reason why they go and spend their, their weekends boozing and drinking and throwing their lives away, a lot of people, is because they want to get away from that, in, in, that eventuality. Because as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kullu nafs, kullu nafsin, Every soul shall taste death. As I said, even they have that saying, two things certain life, death and taxes. They know the death is going to come to them. They know they can't guarantee their life expectancy. They can take life insurance, they can take out all kinds of health, they can live the healthiest lives in the world. But when their time comes, as the Quran mentions, death will reach you even in the highest towers. Not a minute sooner, not a minute later. And really the Prophet ﷺ said that if you knew what I knew, you would laugh little and you would cry very much. You would leave your beds where your wives are. You would leave the enjoyment of the bed and you would go right out into the forests. Just get away from it all and just to appreciate and just to try and spend time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And death is something we should always think about. This is, is hadmul of that. It is the destroyer of desires. That's why we're encouraged to follow the janazah. This is why we're encouraged to look at the dead feet, to look at the, the, to look at the burial of the body. So that we will remember, oh my God, look how small, look how tight that that, that uh, it's six foot under, yet it's about maybe a few feet wide, and there's no coffin to protect us. We're buried straight in there, wrapped in sheets. And once we hear the footsteps walk away, then the questioning begins. Marrabuk, Madinuk, Waman Hada, and about the Prophet Muhammad, who is this person? And there's the squeezing of the grave, which happens to everybody. This is not the punishment of the grave, this is not the crushing, which may happen to a person who is sinful and not repenting, or is a, or is a kafir. But there's a squeezing which the Prophet ﷺ, the, he, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned about Sa'ad bin Mu'ad, he said if there was anybody who was going to be spared from this, it would have been him. So at this point, my dear brothers and sisters, after we, if we, now remember, anybody who has done basic religious studies will answer those questions. Yes, the God of the Muslims is Allah. Yes, their, deen is, their religion is Islam. Their prophet is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But then your Iman will speak, not your memory. And if you pass that, then Alhamdulillah, you're a believer. But there still may be sins for you to pay for. And at that point in time, my dear brothers and sisters, if you see a fire heading towards your grave at that point, or a large serpent, or the worst, or the biggest rat you can ever imagine who's about to chew your body as punishment, what, at that point, what would you give at that point in time to stop that? What are you going to say, take me back? That point where you want to be taken back is now. Imagine that that is that point now. You've been taken back, or you've got your chance now. 
So at this point, when you're calling people to, to Islam, and that person becomes a Muslim, and that person, even while you are dead, is still worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that person marries, then begets believing children, then they, every time they say Alhamdulillah, they sneeze, every time they walk to the masjid, every time their great-great-grandchildren uh, pay some sadaqah, you are getting a share of that reward. That's what you want to be. That's a retirement plan, isn't it? Where the money just keeps, where the ajr keeps rolling in. And this is how, it becomes like a pyramid scheme. For every person that they bring to Islam, we have to make sure that, that then the same thing happens. So this is why it's so important, my dear brothers and sisters, that the masajid have got to become centers, welcoming people to their purpose of life. Telling them about their purpose of life. There needs to be more native Australians, aboriginals, you name it, there should be many more people here praying and giving dawah and bringing more people. This is a legacy we need to leave, leave, my, leave my dear brothers and sisters. The, the, the masjid committee members, the, the imams, everybody, people in charge of this masjid, this is your obligation to make this place one of those places. If you can't do it, make sure that there are the brothers, there are plenty of enthusiastic brothers and sisters who are you know, virtually crying out saying that you know we just need a center we just need a, a base where we can base our dawah activities you can do that just by saying yes go ahead bismillah the reward is there for you they do the hard work you sit back and relax you get you get the reward but really this is what we must be doing in all our masjids everywhere every masjid has got this responsibility these masjids have got to be the the the, the place where strong believers build strong communities that also invite people to Islam and take leadership and not just that but involve in not just preaching but in terms of action as well. Muslims have got to be doing community activities for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because our Prophet said so, he said that, you, that a person is not a true believer. While his belly is full, then his neighbor is starving. There are some people on our streets and neighborhoods old people who, whose family don't visit them anymore. You may not realize it, but some of them may be hungry. In the winter, some of them might be cold and cannot afford the heating. It could be that there's, there's a problem that we need to do for our neighbors. We need, to, we, need to, we need to help them out. So we need to be doing community activities, my dear brothers and sisters, because by this way, first of all, we do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, Nobody will be able to say anything bad about Islam and Muslims because they will say, we don't know who these who those people they're talking about. Because all the Muslims that I know are the most helpful, generous, kind people. I don't believe they want to blow themselves up and kill us all and take over this country. No one will ever believe that. In other words, it will be left to the non-Muslims, if they don't become Muslims, that at least they'll be able to defend Muslims in front of the media. We don't have to. Let them do it. We carry on with our work. So my dear brothers and sisters, really I want to end uh, this, uh, this uh, short discussion here because ultimately this is where we need to be. We need to set ourselves a vision for what, because Muslims are here to stay in Australia. We're not going back now. We're not like maybe our parents or, our, or their parents' generation where we're just going to get our money and go back. That's not happening anymore. But if we are going to stay, no problem, Bismillah. But we have to be calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if we do not call to people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is one of the most selfish and cowardly acts that we can do. Because we are hiding the truth and we are stopping people's fitras from waking up. And with that, we'll end wa akhla ta'wana. And alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, subhanakum wa bihamdik. Ashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Inshallah, we'll open the floor. For some questions yes, and some discussions, Bart So we have 15 minutes to 20 minutes for our question. And uh, then we will pray, and after that, there is a refreshment, inshallah. So, for all, it's open for our questions. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, brother. Barakallahu um, feekum. You said two things here about us. 
Então, Muslims are here to stay in Australia. And then Muslims will need to get involved in community activities because um, that will help portray the good image of Islam, even if to counter like, what the media is saying. I remember during this past Ramadan, my Islam. This past Ramadan, the chief minister of the ACT territory um, sent out an invitation for an iftar dinner. Um, many people thought, you know, we don't welcome this type of thing, we don't have to get involved. There are some sections that says, you know, we have to participate. You know, so I don't know what's your input in that. Second, um, we are here to stay and we are here to get involved with community activities. I've got a family. I, I used to write, but every time I move around, I got my kids, sometimes they write on the wall, and each time I move, I have to pay. So I thought, you know what, if I can afford a mortgage, I go for it. So I, I have a mortgage that I live in, and this also is not going down well with some brothers because it's really well. Um, I just want to stop there. What's your input in these two issues? Because um, yeah, it impact on me. Well, yeah, comes up. I can feel uh, question. So, the brother, to address your first question regarding the iftar that was arranged by the chief minister of ACT, um, I believe that look, it's you know, just uh, I just come in, a, come in a week ago, and here, you know, giving the, I'm not going to be giving fatwas left, right, and centre about uh, this place. But what I will say is that the most knowledgeable people who are here should be consulted. And first of all, first of all, we as Muslims need to unite. Okay, we need to unite and the ideal situation is that we have one representative who should be ideally lead, leading us. I'm going to keep on saying ideally because I know that it's a very difficult thing to happen because of various divisions that we have in our community for whatever reason. But there's no harm in thinking about what we should be aiming for. That really in, the, in, in wherever we should be, even when we go on a journey, what are you supposed to do? Select an Amir, right? What about, you know, even more so when the Prophet ﷺ sent the Muslims to Abyssinia and also the first delegation that went out to Medina for the, for the, for the, for the various hijras? Then the Prophet ﷺ appointed Amirs, Umarah. He appointed Amirs to be in charge of the affairs of the Muslims. So what I would suggest is, is that the Muslims need to get together, the knowledgeable and the most, uh, uh, the most uh, trustworthy and the most uh, uh, appropriate people should be chosen and they should to make well really it's the scholars that need to make the decision as to attend these gatherings or not depending on the benefits and the harms which is an ijtihadi matter and is something for the scholars and the people of knowledge to decide in principle you know this is you know the, the prophet sallallahu used to respond well to uh to uh genuine acts of kindness from other leaders the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam Anha was a slave, a Coptic slave, who was given as a gift by the king of Egypt. When the Prophet wrote him a letter inviting him to Islam, he responded kindly by saying, thanks but no thanks, but here is a, here is a gift of a, of a slave girl, which he, sallallahu alayhi wa there's a different opinion whether he married her or whether he kept her as a slave. But inshallah, there was obviously, the Prophet had a, had a child, child with her, who was Ibrahim. So the Prophet ﷺ did respond to kind acts of invitation, of invitation such as this. But again, it's, uh, it's, uh, there may be other issues that may be at play, political and otherwise, which I have no knowledge of. And I will respect the elders and the seniors of the community here by saying that they should, be, that they should consult with the people of knowledge here. And if not, then uh, people of knowledge outside in Australia or otherwise, and they should make their decision otherwise. Uh, but in general, there's nothing, if there's no haram by doing this, then inshallah there would be no problem in principle, but uh, Allah knows best about that. Um, to answer your second point about being asked to move around and, uh, and, and, and you know, you're, you're being asked to leave your house uh, every six months or, 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 or uh, every year, then I would say that it's a lot better than Jahannam. I'm sorry to put it like this, but really this is the choice. It's either that or war from Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. As the Quran says very clearly, that uh, that uh, Allah has declared, Allah's Messenger declared war against riba. Um, if you did it, 
then inshallah make make toba is a, if a person is a got a riba based mortgage is a toba inshallah it's wiped out and the person who does toba is like he didn't sin at all and he becomes closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a result but uh, make no mistake my dear brothers and sisters that these are cursed dirty things it's all very nicely wrapped up in the bank manager brochures but ultimately it's the same thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us my dear brothers and sisters with the difficulty of because did we expect Allah says did you expect that you're going to enter Jannah like those before without being tested like those like you tested those people before you life is a test my dear brothers and sisters I'm not saying it's easy I mean I rent as well I've been renting for Allah how long and yes it's it is painful seeing that money go but you know it's better as I said then it's better than than answering to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Allah asked me on the day of judgment he says that look what why did you take riba because I didn't want to move every six months it's it, that's gonna be that's gonna be difficult to say my dear brother it's gonna be difficult to say that hardship that you have to do and believe me I hate moving is one of the most traumatic experiences I know because even though I've done it three, man, how many times I've done it twice three times in my life you know even in in the UK they did a survey they said it's worse than divorce it's more traumatic than divorce people are more you know people find it more difficult to deal with it's true it, you know you pack your whole life up and you, you're deciding what to keep what to throw it's difficult you know we should not underestimate the difficulty that brothers and sisters go through but my dear brothers and sisters you know whatever difficulty there is in this in this in this life it is nothing compared to the difficulty in the hereafter the man who enjoyed nothing but ni'am, nothing but blessings and the, the, Allah will dip him in, in Jahannam for a split second on the Day of Judgment and will ask him, have you, have you remembered anything? Do you remember any, any khair? He says, no, wallahi, I don't remember any good in my life. Likewise, the one who suffered nothing but hardship. Can you imagine, forget six months, every day they're worrying about what food they're going to have, what clothing they're going to have, whether their children are going to die or live. You know, people have this problem in Somalia and East Africa nowadays. They don't know when their next meal is coming from. They, if they live their entire life like that, let alone two to three years, dipped into Jannah, Allah will ask them, have you tasted any hardship? We'll say, Wallahi, I have not tasted any hardship. So my dear brothers and sisters, really the, 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 the issue here is regarding, uh, is regarding uh, as I said, major sins and things that are cursed. The Prophet says that the four people are cursed when it comes to riba, the one who gives it, the one who takes it, and the two witnesses that witness the contract. So my dear brothers and sisters, if, if you've taken it, make repentance, keep away from it now, inshallah Allah will not write it amongst your sins. And uh, inshallah I ask Allah that he keeps us uh, safe from these, these ills, inshallah ta'ala. Sister's yes, there's a sister's question which I'll answer as well. So, what do you do if you feel like you're a bad Muslim and praying, etc., are just repetitive actions? Well, my dear sister, what I would advise strongly is to learn the meanings of what you are saying in your prayer. When you're saying Subhana Rabbi Allah in your sajda, you are at this mo moment calling upon Allah who is beyond all creation, who is higher than then outside of creation therefore he's higher than all of creation then you are calling upon him learn the meanings and there's mujahada here there is going to be struggle it's not going to be easy as Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah mentioned that there are four levels of people when it comes to salah that one of them is that he is he or she is striving in their prayer to keep khushur it's an ongoing battle my dear brothers and sisters it's not something that is ever going to end but even that mujahada, even that, that uh, striving is rewardable and is an act of worship in itself. So learn your prayers, learn what they mean. Read the Quran for at least 15 minutes a day. Nothing more, nothing less. If you're not doing any, if you're doing more than that, alhamdulillah, carry on. But if you're not doing up to 15 minutes, read 15 minutes, as soon as 15 minutes are up, close it. Make it a habit. My dear brother says everything's about habit. In fact, the way this world works is habit. The way the valleys have been made, the Grand Canyon, was just the habit of a river, the river that just went to and fro for thousands and thousands of years. The vegetation, Allah brought life to the earth after its death by sending persistent rain. We will enter Jannah, inshallah ta'ala. Allah loves those acts which are repetitive, which are repeated and done again and again, even if they are small. Just keep doing these small actions and then they will snowball into bigger actions, bigger actions, and then you will want to strive for more. 
like anything in life, exercise or, uh, or studying for your exams, the ones who cram find it the hardest, but the one who's studying regularly, mastered the subjects. This is the sunnah of Allah with everything. You've just got to carry on and persist. So my dear sister, what I would advise is just carry on striving, keep on doing it. And you know when shaitan tells you, don't pray your, your sunnahs of dhuhr, there's so many. And by the time you pray your fard, you're not going to be anywhere. As my, one of my teachers, one of my shiuk, he said that the khushu isn't doing those sunnah prayers. Meaning that when you do those sunnah prayers, even despite that you fear that your mind is going to be elsewhere by the time the fard starts. The fact that you are doing it for the sake of Allah is your khushu for that point. And then inshallah you'll get it throughout your salah. So there's this, act, there's this kind of like barrier to leap first. Once you get over that, then inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as is mentioned in the hadith, you take steps towards Allah, Allah comes rushing towards you. Still we have time for three questions. Yeah, yes, I mean generally the scholars say that okay by land of mushriks by extension it means the land of Ahl Kitab as well. And it is very true that in places like India, where my family originally from and, uh, and other such places, it is true that, you know, it's actually quite sad that how little the dawah efforts have been there. Obviously there is the communal tensions which may be in certain places which we shouldn't underestimate. And that threat is there in some places, so you have to be very careful. But generally for those people who are working in professional jobs, where people are generally very educated, then there is no harm as you'll find inshallah on the course on Saturday, yet another plug for the course, but you'll find that it's very easy to start up conversations with Hindu colleagues about these very subjects. Uh, I imagine a lot of Indian software companies are here in Canberra, where you'll meet a lot of Hindu colleagues, and it's a great point, and you will realize that there's plenty of ways in which we can do very polite da'wah without insulting. Because the Prophet, because the Quran says, do not insult their gods in case they uns insult Allah back in their ignorance. So, for example, you can say, um, uh, you know, if you, if you don't mind me asking you, um, could it be that the Rama, Krishna, Sita, Shiva, these were all maybe pious people that maybe ended up being worshipped? Because we know from the Tafsir of Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with both him and his father. Al Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, the, the uncle of the Prophet, وسلم, that he mentioned in the tafsir that after, for the, 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 after Adam, السلام, mankind were on Tawheed for 10 generations until people started making, uh, then Shaitan came to them and said to them, you know, uh, make some statues uh, of the, some pious people. <coughs> Alhamdulillah. So the, uh, as the as the as the uh, these the, the five pious people then ended up becoming then then Shaitan came to him and said make some idols put them in the back of the masjid then he came to another generation later said put them in the front of the masjid then another generation forgot put them in front of the the, the, the masjid and then people started making sajda towards them and they forgot why that's how shit started so you can kindly politely say that without insulting them say that could it be that these are these are these are pious people. Because if you look at the stories of the, uh, if you read the Gita and other, play, other, other books like that, you will see that these gods do very ungodlike things. So you say that, you know, maybe God doesn't do this, and maybe these were pious people, you know, or, 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 or famous people, or brave people, or something like that. You can start off in a very respectful way and get them to think that is this something I should be worshipping? Inshallah, this is a this is a short answer to that reply, but yes, we should definitely be giving dawah in whichever non-Muslim country we're in. Even in the Muslim countries where there's plenty of expatriates running the show, as we know in the Middle East, that is also a place where we should be doing dawah. There are dawah centers set up in Qatar and places like that, bringing mashallah lots of people to Islam. 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 Islam.
loan where I said an individual person who goes to the bank and takes a loan, or it is haram, and it is, uh, no, it's not Padira Pranam, but it is very, you know. what about the state level? All the IMF, what about the World Bank, what about the GIA giving aid to the Muslim, uh, or not, non Muslim, whatever, who are people, and they all have got a stream of their religions. It's not a free. Even here in the 480 used to come at the time of Pakistan week or for uh, or many in part, they are all extreme that there are interests involved. And those countries who get that, whether only the government is responsible for this thing or the individual people who is getting the benefit of it. Yes, I mean, <clears throat> obviously on the state level, subhanAllah, the 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 ruler of that particular Muslim country in question or otherwise is responsible for taking this loan and so the sin falls upon him and the government and those people who made that decision. But it's very true, my dear brothers and sisters, that you've got to understand that even non-Muslims are, are mounting a lot of campaigns talking about, especially with the financial collapse in Europe and in, and in the United States, many non-Muslims are looking for answers to the banking crisis. And they as well know, as, as well as anybody else, that fractional reserve banking, where what you do is you lend out more than you actually have, which is what the whole riba system is, is, is built on, then this is a bubble that's going to burst very soon. And when it bursts, everyone's going to be hit by the shreds of the balloon that is going to burst. So what is happening now is that they know that the IMF and the World Bank, there are ways in which certain countries are kept politically under control. It's a way of basically keeping them quiet and, and by, by restricting trade going in and out of these countries and making sure they go to the right, or going to, the, in this case, not the right countries, and make sure that the most of the world still remains in poverty, even though there is so much resource in all these countries. So it's the responsibility of all our governments, my dear brothers and sisters, to rule by an Islamic economic system. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this system to us to implement. It's not there as a fairy tale to, live, to stay in the Quran, to recite. It's there, it worked, it was done, and it was the answer to every... Yes, I'll come to you, brother. Just please, inshallah. Uh, let me just give me one minute, inshallah. So the point here is that every that we've been given that the Quran, so I'm trying to talk about this purpose of life, this what we're saying, this deen has been just given to us. All we have to do is we have to just extract it and implement it. The hard work has been done. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Hakim, Al-Alim. And until we start to really eradicate and work towards an Islamic economic system, which is going to be fair for everybody, not just the Muslims. Even non-Muslims are looking at these kind of ways of banking and finance because they know it's going to lead to the khair, inshallah ta'ala. Wallahu alam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My origin, when I spoke to Tunisia, and I come, I was born in the United States. I was born in the United States. So, it's all a bit, you know, an unusual life situation here. The reason is because we left back home from corruption here and there, talking about them, we said, oh, that's one type of problem. Now, we can't really see them for running from the worst, from the bad and come to the worst, as far as I believe, personally. Now, what we're going to do, people who are quite themselves as Muslims, they don't do much about Muslims, and we get paid by people who pay them to keep the people going, but those people who are in need are not there, they work for themselves, or for their property, or for their service. Example, our mosque. We need attention, we have a lot of But there are some people who do it, they do it back too, but they're not good, they do it not good enough. One of them is that they don't want to go and set up a question and not. What do we have to do for us? So, to do for, the, for those people who are who are basically come to this country oh, now? The people who basically who are in charge of the most or who are themselves as Muslims, they get paid from overseas so somehow, they don't do nothing from Muslims. In this country? Yes. In this country, okay. Okay. Zakhlas khair. In general, my dear brothers and sisters, we should realize that mas'uliya, uh, responsibility and leadership, re'asa, these are not privileges, these are a burden. These are a severe burden and uh, every person who is in charge of anything, 
whether it's a family, whether it's his money, whether it's a masjid, whether it's a community, you, we are going to be asked about all of these things. The flocks that we've been put in charge of as shepherds, we will be asked about. So um, really, my dear brothers and sisters, I mean, I, I, you know, anybody who's in charge of any Islamic project, any community really has to, I advise you to spend day and night reading the life and Bible for Umar bin Khattab. He is the man who, who showed what leadership really was in its completeness. Obviously, it's not to say that Abu Bakr didn't or anything like that, but because his khilafah was very short, but the khilafah of Umar was just uh, an absolute masterpiece. I mean, you know, the, you know, the story when he walks around at night and he sees this lady boiling rocks in a big cauldron and her children are there crying and uh, he, Umar who he He's on his patrol, you know, he's dressed in rags. He doesn't have the, doesn't come up in a limousine with his bodyguards coming out, obviously. He's, he's walking around in his rags. And when he, when he asks her, what, what, what is this? She says, you know, the Khalifa, he hasn't provided for us. You know, we, you know, we, I don't have any, I'm just cooking these rocks just so that my children will get tired and fall asleep while they are playing. And Umar al when he was with his uh, servant Aslam, he then says, "Come, let's go to the bait. Let's go to the bait of man. Let's get some food right now." So he goes and he, he goes. He says, "He says, wait a minute. Let me go. And, let me go and uh, let me get this. Let me go and get something for you." He goes and he's about to carry the sack. And Aslam, his servant, says, "No, no let me carry it." Amir al-Mumini says, "Are you going to carry my burden on the day of judgment? Are you going to carry my burden on the day of judgment?" He says, "No." He carries it. He carries it. He walks all the way there. He empties the flour and the whatever ingredients there were, and he cooks himself. And the Aslam says it's like I can see the smoke coming into his beard. And he cooks himself, and then he satisfies the. He gives the food to the lady and her children, and then she says, "Oh, you know, the, she says something about the Khalifa. You know, where's the Khalifa? You know, uh, you know, I'm going to complain to the Khalifa about this. You know, thank you, kind sir, for doing this." And uh, you know, uh, she, he said, "Look, when you if you come to the Khalifa, you will find me there." Right, so she assumed okay, maybe he knows the Khalifa or something, and he walks off. You know, the fact that he, Brother Nan, used to just sleep under a tree, uh, you know, just uh, due to just exhaustion during his night patrols and then his, and then spending time during the day. It's mentioned in the, the book of Suyuti, Tariq al Khulafa, the history of the Khulafa, that he used to just drink olive oil because there was not much food in those times, such that his, uh, his skin had become almost olive colored. Uh, you know, this is really, my dear brothers and sisters, I mean, you, this is the kind of, this is the model of leadership, where you should go, and now and again, I advise every masjid committee leader to go and fix the shoes in the foyer. More than I used to do this. When his khalida is going to fix the shoes in the masjid, to keep his ego down. He would also, while he was also a khalifa, he would also be a quli, he would also be a person helping the, the, the travelers coming into Medina. Subhan, this is leadership. This is leadership. Leadership is not palaces. Leadership is not sitting in these places. Leadership is, leadership is, subhanAllah, if these are the responsibilities of mas'uliyah. These are the responsibilities of leadership. We should never want, you know, people should be running away from leadership. Then the ones who at least want it, inshallah ta'ala they'll get it. Inshallah, this is what brothers should do. MashaAllah. Yeah. 
No, inshallah. I mean, any act, any actual worship, extra acts of worship a person does in order to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, I'm not going to be so stupid or I'm not in a, I'm going to speak in front of Allah to say who's good, what he's going to accept or who isn't. Of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not let the work of those who do good be lost. So inshallah, Allah will reward in plenty. And if a person suddenly becomes busy and cannot do that anymore, then inshallah, there's no problem. I'm not saying that... Uh, look, the main thing is what I'm trying to say is that we need to fulfill our obligations as a minimum. That if we don't fulfill obligations, then we are punishable. Any nuffle acts, any extra acts, no problem. If they go up and down, that's what happens, no problem. Due to time, due to business, due to whatever. That's not the problem. The only issue is, is that when we're shirking our responsibilities and our obligations, that's what I'm talking about. Um, just to make a small point, or just which I remembered as what the brother was saying, is it's time that we brothers, and I'm not saying this about anybody in particular, but we all have a tendency to do this. We are looking at what other people are doing and not what we are doing. It's true that if you see somebody not fulfilling their responsibility, make dua for them. Secondly, thank Allah that you are not that person, that you are not being tested with that fitna, because Allah can test you with the fitna as well. Thirdly, then concentrate on your own affairs, and as long as you do your obligation by advising that brother, privately first of all, because this is the way of, if you get up in a khutbah and you, and, and you, give a, and you, you lambast somebody, they're very likely, less likely to come back to anything. Imagine if somebody wanted to correct us and they announced it at the khutbah that such and such does this. You know, you feel very embarrassed. It's human nature. Take them to one side, advise them with lutf, risk uh, rift, which is what the, uh, with, with, with leniency and with brotherly love, and perhaps they may turn back. And then if not, then if there's some, if there's some major wrong, there'll be some khair in you openly professing it to those people can, that can do something about it, then that's also another issue. But the main thing is to use hikmah, and, uh, and, uh, and this is the main thing that we need to use. Maybe a last question. Yeah. 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 Very thankful that you came here, brother. Barakallah, yeah. yeah. inshallah, I'll accept it. Yeah. But, um, I have to say, it's a bit of disappointing. Uh, show up here. Like, um, how, do you have any suggestions how we can give ourselves a, a good, good kick up the backside and um, get more inspired with the Well, the first thing I'd recommend is maybe take some kind of yoga or gymnastics that you can reach your backside if you're going to kick it. Um, that's one way. The, uh, the other way would be, my dear brothers and sisters, is that once Dawah starts here, inshallah we'll see the effect. We'll see once people start doing things together, like calling non-Muslims to Islam, and people see that the, the shahad is coming in and the new Muslims are coming in, Alhamdulillah, our experience is that this brings people together. It brings people together, it'll unite the masajid in one common cause, and inshallah ta'ala, once people start feeling there's activity, then people want to jump on the bandwagon. That's why the sabiqoon al awwaloon min al-muhajin wal ansar Allah praises the early people, because they came when nobody else was here. So let's not criticize the brothers that turn up, we should congratulate them, mashallah. Because one, because they'll be the forebearers of those people that come, when inshallah there'll be a time when maybe you brother will be complaining, there's no space in the masjids anymore, we need to build bigger masjids. And inshallah we hope for that time to come, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakumullah khairan wa akhla da'wana alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. No, we can't have too many last questions man, come on. We're not Qadianis, there's only one last prophet, we don't have any more prophets after this.